We are glad everybody is here today. I've got a lesson that's kind of like last Sunday's lesson, but yet it's very different. It's entitled, What Does the Lord Require of Thee? And um, I'm not sure exactly what's going to come out of this lesson. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. <laughs> Would it not be great if God would just tell us, what is it you want? You know, what, what is it that we do to please you? Just give me a list. Let me check it off. One, two, three. Now, I think sometimes we take faith, repentance, confession, and baptism as a checklist. That's not exactly what that is. He did do that in the Old Testament, kind of. Uh... I'm going to give you a couple of passages. I had one last week. We'll look at that one more time. Then I'm adding this one to it. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul. The fear there is respect again. It is that you look at God, you see him as a, a supreme being, and you're going to show him respect. You're going to worship him. You're going to obey him. You're going to do all those kinds of things. And all the rest of those things in that list there are contingent upon you fearing him. Well, I bring this to you today because... I believe that in our lives, the lack of respect for God is why we don't do better. The lack of respect for God is why more people are not Christians. It's why this building is not filled. It's why we don't have to build a new auditorium because so many people. Because there's no respect for God in our land. That's kind of like what Micah said. Remember last week? He showed the old man what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Now that's about all we're going to do with these two passages this morning. <laughs> I'm going to want you to remember, however, the, the flavor of those passages. What is it God requires of you? Don't try to make a checklist. But the flavor of walking with him, the flavor of justice and mercy, the flavor of obeying him. You kind of get that in you, wrap your mind around it. Because that's where I want you to go this morning. And we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 first. In verse 1, he says, I beg you, don't receive the grace of God in vain. Now, I want you to know something. This is not verbatim quotes, okay? This is Charlie. All right? I've taken it. I've condensed it. I've put it in my words, trying to get what the Bible is saying here. And what that tells me is, you can receive grace, and you can receive grace in vain. And we want to find the difference in those two things so that we can get something that's practical to us. So he says, now is the time of salvation. One of my commentaries said that that verse in verse 2 should be attached to the last chapter. Or at least if it's in this position, it ought to be in parenthetical phrase. Because it just doesn't fit. I think it fits. Don't receive the, the grace of God in vain. Chapter of, uh, 5 has said he's given you grace of God. Don't receive it in vain because now is a time for you to seize the moment. That's what that means. Now is a time for you to take advantage of what God has done for you, given for you, and promised to you. Let's see, Lord. Put no stumbling block before anyone so the ministry cannot be blamed. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people 
why don't you become a Christian? Well, because so-and-so down there claims to be a Christian and I don't want to be like him. That's actually happened. I don't want to be like them. Because you see, they go to church on Sunday, but on Saturday, they do this. And it's not nice. They gossip, they steal, they do all kinds of things that are ungodly. So he says, don't you live a life that puts a stumbling block before somebody else to keep them away from the Lord. Okay. Does the Lord require that of me? That's why I'm presenting it to you. Our lifestyles are before God and they are, will be called into an account. Verse 4, I've got a problem with it. I want you to know. I've changed it somewhat because you see, I have here for you all are ministers of God. And Paul was talking about his ministry in that passage. But there are other passages that say we are ministers. And God requires us to exchange or ex discharge our ministry correctly. As I came up here this morning, uh, Eastwood uh, had a problem with their transmission and you couldn't hear anything that was going on. It was just <laughs> static. So I turned over to the Christian radio uh, program and the guy over there was talking about before you were made, God determined what you would be. Now, I don't know how true that is, but he made some pretty good points of that God doesn't call you to do something and not give you the talent and the ability to do it. And that fits here real well. If God wants me to be this, that, or another, guess what? He will have provided me with all the talents, the ability, and the smarts to do it. So what does he say here? Don't put a stumbling block before others. Discharge your ministry. So what is my ministry? All of us need to know what our ministry is. He says, well, you're going through some stuff. And the people in Middle Tennessee this morning, they're going through some stuff. Some pitiful stuff. Some sad stuff. Some heart-wrenching stuff. He said, you should show Christ. And then he gives what you do it with. On your outline, by the Holy Ghost. Be pure. Show the wisdom of knowledge in the be in control. Show kindness through love. Again, those are my words. But they're there. You live with the Spirit in you. So by the Holy Ghost. He says be pure. Because you have the Holy Spirit in you, it should cause you to change your lifestyle. In other words, there's some things I would really like to do. That's the flesh. But because I am a Christian, a child of God, I'm going to refrain from that. Now, I wish I could say I was 100% totally accurate in that. No, I'm not. Lord, forgive me when I fail. Be pure. In my Sunday school lesson down at uh, Springville, I used a passage from Peter this morning where it said, give diligence to add, and it talked about those graces. I had that about three or four weeks ago. I threw it in that lesson too. Pure. Then show in your life the wisdom of knowledge. Now, wisdom and knowledge are two different things. Knowledge is a fact, a thing, and wisdom is how do you use the fact. So show in your life by the Holy Ghost that you know something. And the thing that you know there is not the Bible. The thing that you know there is the presence of the Lord. You see Him. You understand He's there. You watch Him work in your life. You know He's there. 
Paul says, what do you require? I require all my ministers to set a proper example by the Holy Ghost of purity and the wisdom of knowledge of Jesus in you. Then he says, be in control. And that means to have restraints. Um, the King James there probably uses something like meekness. I've forgotten which, what word it uses there. But be in control. Show kindness toward one another by call, because of love. God requires that kind of lifestyle. Not a checklist, but this is a holy, loving, giving, concerning lifestyle. And God requires it. Wow. Let's move to verse 7 there. He says for us to use the word of truth with the power of God dressed in the armor of righteousness in every way. The word of truth. The gospel, yeah. More appropriately, it is the gift of Jesus. You have been gifted. You have been blessed through him. And because of that, that, that should change things. We should acknowledge it as truth, not in just word, but also by the way in which we live. For instance, right now, are you scared of this disease? Some people have to shake their head, yeah, and some people have to shake their head, no. Those who shake their head, no, probably are in ignorance. Those who shake their head, yes, probably are scared to death. And God doesn't want us to be either way. <laughs> Don't be foolish. So those of you wearing your masks, that's wonderful and fine. You're not being foolish. Don't know about those who are not. <laughs> Y'all all may be vaccinated. Everything may be fine. It's okay. Don't be foolish. But be wise. Don't take extra chances. Don't put yourself in jeopardy. That's not fear. That's just wisdom. And there is a very big difference. And the reason why you do that is because you are dressed with God's power. You have the gospel of Jesus. You have his forgiveness. You have his Holy Spirit within you. You have the power of God resting upon you. So you live as though you're that person because that's what you are as a Christian. And you're dressed in the armor of righteousness. And Adam Clark says you got to go back to Ephesians 6 right there. Dressed in the armor of God. This is in righteousness, in right doing. That's taking that armor and putting it into activity and making it work for you. God, I've got in my hand your shield. I do. The word of God. No, that's wrong. My faith is the shield. God, i got in my other hand your sword, which is the word of God. So I have faith on one hand. I have the sword in the other hand. And that's what's going to protect us. Dressed in his armor in every way. Verse 8, he says, regardless of what you have to go through, be true to God. We talked the other day about uh, being tortured and tormented. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming to the United States of America. It's coming right here to Henry County. And it's coming right here to New Bethel. And our minds need to be set and made up now. Are we going to stand for the Lord or not? This passage says, In every way be dressed in the armor of God, that you may be true to Him. What does God require? He requires us to be true to Him. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 now, verses 15 through 18. 
He says, see that none render evil unto any man, but follow that which is good. We are to be examples of what righteousness and holiness is. We are to be example of what a servant of God is. We're not to return evil for evil. But when someone does you evil, what you do is, number one, you forgive them so God will in turn forgive you. And number two is, you pray for that person. And you love that person and you try to get them to straighten up and fix whatever it is. If they won't, you've done what's right and they're going to have to answer for it. So render no evil unto any man. But follow that which is good. And only God is good. Verse 16 says rejoice evermore. Even if people are doing you evil. The attitude and response of a Christian is. That you respond with rejoicing. Thank you God. The other day I was listening to a, a lesson. And the guy said something about. Uh, the trials and tribulations of Christianity. And they are many. But he said, even though you are put down, even though you're persecuted, even though you may be killed, you still have something to rejoice in. Let me tell you what that is. I have been forgiven and I'm going to heaven. I am his work. Therefore, Anything that's wrong in me is not him. It's my, un, not my lack of doing. And what I need to do is I need to look for the pieces that are missing in my life, put them in there, and give God the praise and the glory. Rejoice evermore. Whether good things happen to you or bad things. Rejoice evermore. And then he says, no matter what people are doing to you, pray without ceasing. Have that attitude of prayer. And finally then, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. What does God require of you? Do you see it there? Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Wow. We move to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 14. He starts off that passage by saying godliness with contentment is great gain. And boy, we talk about how uh, we ought to be content. I've learned to be content in all things, all those kinds of scriptures. Well, what he's saying here is if you are doing what's right, contentment will go along with it and it will be the best gift you could give yourself. I know a lot of people are not very satisfied with their life. And a lot of people are having problems with all kinds of psychological things. You, know, you were talking about one as we were coming in here this morning. And Lord be with that person and bless that person with peace. And may their problems be solved. I've got people in my own family that are having problems psychological problems and it's very difficult to deal with as a family as a minister it's very difficult to deal with and about all you can do is you can point them to the Lord and you can pray for them that's really about all you're going to be able to help them with but Paul tells these people here that in your Christian life you be content if we have food and clothing be content I don't know if any of us in here miss very many meals. I mean, I can look at us and maybe Scott there looks pretty skinny. But, and maybe, maybe Teresa back there and Cindy. But other than that, you know, we're pretty healthy people. <laughs> I'm not too concerned about your grocery table, you know. Uh, be content. You're all dressed fine. Be content. We have a roof over our heads. You know, be content. It is a blessing from God. But sometimes my want to's get outside my contentment. 
And there I have to bring it back. What is God telling me here? What does he require of me? He requires of me to be content. He says, as a child of God, flee worldly lust. That's what happens when you're not content. You get caught up in the worldly lust. An example was Saul, old King Saul in the Old Testament. God chose him, handpicked him to make him the king of Israel. He was the first king of Israel. Man, he's got it all going. And then some women said, uh, hey, look at David. Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his ten thousands. Look at David. And so Saul takes his eyes off of God, the master, and he puts it on David. And when you take your eyes off of God and put it on things of the world, your life goes crazy. And God stripped Saul of his kingdom. Flee worldly lust, Paul tells us. Because our minds are not supposed to be set upon this earth anyway. We are just pilgrims passing through it. Our minds are to be set upon our God in heaven and being with him. He says and when you get your mind off of that, you chase after, you go after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Get off of be content first. Be content. Get away from the lust of the world. And go after these things. These positive good things. In other words. Personal self improvement. Based upon the word of God. I'm giving you a minute to finish writing. A couple of them are still writing. Verse 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, I know a lot of people who don't think that we're in a fight. You know, we're not, Christians are not supposed to fight, right? Turn the other cheek, walk away, that kind of thing. Well, that's true in relationships. That's not true in the fight of faith. Because you see, we're, our fight is not with the world. It's not with people. It's against principalities and powers in heavenly places. It's about the spiritual world. And then, oh, Satan is after you to get you and going to try to destroy you. And you've got to fight. You've got to fight the temptations of the world that he will put before you. You've got to fight your own lust. It is a battle. And that's why the armor of God is given in Ephesians 6. Because we are in a battle. So you be sure to fight. Don't go before the battle and let the battle take you. You fight it because you are guaranteed to win if you will try. And he says, take hold of eternal life. I guess one of my biggest peeves is a Christian who says, I hope I'm good enough to go to heaven. Or another Christian says, I just want to be a doorkeeper. Just, just barely get in there. Well, I'm going to tell you, you don't want to go, period, if that's your case. God has not promised you to be a doorkeeper. He has promised you in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 for you to be abundantly ushered into the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. Not just by the skin of your teeth and not barely, but abundantly. And you know what word Peter uses there? Shall. Shall is a legal term. And it means there is no option. This is the way it's going to be. All you've got to do is to walk with the Lord and that's what you get. You fight the good fight of faith and you take hold of the eternal life that he has promised you, given to you, by the blood of Jesus. Now watch this. For this is what God has called you. What's he called me to? He's called me 
to fight. Sometimes it's with myself. All the time it's with Satan. But he's called me to fight. What's he called me to? He's called me to take a hold of the gift that he's offering. He's handing it out here. Take a hold of it. Don't let it go. And he says, and I command you to keep this command until Jesus comes. What does the Lord require of you? Here it is. Flee lust, take hold of eternal life, and fight forevermore. So let's bring it together now. I think these things have embodied the idea of those Old Testament passages I gave you. What does the Lord require of you, Israel? To love mercy, to do justly, and walk humbly with thy God. What does he require of you? It's exactly the same thing as Micah and Deuteronomy put forth. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. To fear the Lord and to walk in his ways, to love him and to serve him. I don't think there's any doubt about it. We still need to be in that mode. But it's not a checklist. It's a living list. And this life will be led in spiritual growth. Peter talks in both 1 Peter and 2 Peter about our growing spiritually. We will know that the Lord is in our life if we do. And we will meet him. And, and he'll say, come on in. So let me quote Jesus here as we close this out. I must be about my father's business. And he asked his mother, don't you know I must be about my father's business? He was 12 years old. He had already learned that principle. At 12 years old, I've got to obey God. What does he require? In the Old Testament, those two passages and this conglomeration, he requires a life of growth, of spirit filled, of following him, and of being submissive unto him. He did then, he still does now. What does the Lord require of you?